Well, as we get started this morning, the one thing we have to do is that we're joining with Lakeside Downtown today, so they're going to be watching this talk by video. So what we have to do is we want to say, hi, Lakeside Downtown, but we're going to do it together. I'll count to three and we'll say it together. Hi, Lakeside Downtown. Ready? One, two, three. Hi, Lakeside Downtown. Great. And about now they're shouting back at us, so that'll be a good thing. Can you hear them? There we go. Well, we're glad to have them joining us today as we wrap up this series called Pressure Points. And we've been looking at these various kinds of pressure, these pressure points that find their way into our lives. And today, we're going to look at the pressure point of waiting, the pressure of waiting. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know a human being who loves to wait. Wait is with that four-letter word that some of you just detest. We don't like the idea of waiting. It's just not something that any of us really enjoy. There isn't a person sitting in this room that goes, yes, let me raise my hand. I'm the one among the crowd who loves to wait. Because none of us love it. None of us like it. Some of us tolerate it at best. And we, we're, we're kind of, it's kind of in us to be negative right from the beginning of our lives. I mean, when you're a little kid and you want something from your mom and dad, that most dreaded words your mom and dad can say to you is what? Wait. Well, no would be more dreaded, but wait, you know. Wait is the second most uh, dreaded thing that they could say. Because it's, and, and so our whole lives, waiting is never a positive experience. It never has positive overtones attached to it. Waiting always implies that there is something I want now, something I need now, but I have to wait for a period of time before I get it. That's literally what waiting is all about. We all live here in the here and now. We all have a now. And all of us are waiting for something to happen, something to happen in our lives. It can be big or it can be small, but when it does happen, it's a then. So we have the difference between now and then, and in between here we have the zone of waiting. And the reality is, the longer these two things are apart, the more pressure we feel on that zone. The longer we have to wait, the more pressure we feel on the zone of waiting. And this is simply what it's all about. We have our now, we have our then, we have the zone of waiting, and that's where many of us today, for some area or some issue in our lives, that's where we find ourselves. And none of us like that. You don't like that zone, and neither do I. And yet we live in a culture where we're instantly and digitally connected. We live so for the moment we want everything to happen in a hurry. We, we want instant results, and we want instant gratification. And we do everything we can to try to close the gap between now and then. We have tried to hurry. We have tried instant communication. We try so many things because we don't like to wait, and we do everything we can do to close the gap. All of us do it. All of us do it. I mean, how many times have you ever sent an email or a text or a Facebook message to someone, and you want something from them, you want to reply, and as soon as you send it, you hold your phone, and you watch it for about the next hour. Every 10 seconds, you're looking at it, have they got back, have they got back to me? And we all do that. I mean, I do that, others do it to me. I had someone uh, this week send me an email and they wanted something from me, and it didn't seem all that important. It was probably really important to them, but it didn't seem that important in the busyness of my day. And so I kind of went, oh yeah, I'll get back to them later. And within an hour, I got a text message from them saying, did you get my email? And because I knew patience creates character, <laughs> I didn't get back to them for about an hour, and they're probably seething at that moment. And yet, when you think about it, we do things in our culture, in our lives, because we want things in an instant to reduce the gap between now and then. In fact, we would love it if there was no gap at all. Now, some people are better at waiting than others. I get that. Almost everyone is better than waiting than me. My family are down here, and they could give you a huge amen to that. I hate waiting. I hate waiting in traffic jams. 
I will go out of my way, miles out of my way, take a whole different route so I'm at least moving. I may get there in the same time as if I had sat in that line, but at least I'm moving and it feels like I'm not waiting. I know some of you do exactly the same thing. I hate to wait in restaurants. Is that not true? I have this built-in clock. And when they take my order, this clock starts ticking, and I know exactly how long it should be for them to place my order, cook my food, and deliver it to the table. And when the alarm goes off and it's not there, I start giving the waitress the stink eye, you know, like, what, you know, what's going on? I give her that look every time she goes by. And uh, I look at my watch, and I get really fidgety, and I get really restless, and my kids hate it, and I make comments, and I just don't like to wait. I don't like to wait in line. That's why Canada's Wonderland and other theme parks have no enjoyment for me. I love the rides. I hate the line. I hate waiting in line. There's nothing more than that dreaded sign says, you are this three hours from getting on this ride. There's nothing worse than that. I hate air travel. I love getting there quicker, but I hate that hurry up and wait routine. You know, you rush to the airport and you wait in line, and then you rush to here and you wait. It's rush, wait, rush, wait, the whole routine. I hate it. I hate it. And if I get there and it says my flight is delayed even for minutes, I'm looking out the window going, where's that plane coming? When's it coming so that we can get on it? Now, those are little annoyances that I don't like to wait on. The other thing I don't like to wait on is people. I don't like to wait on other people. Anybody but me not like that? I don't like to wait on other people. I'm one of those people that believe on time is five minutes early. I really do. I'm one of those people. So when I get to an appointment, I try to be early or try to be as close to on time as I can, usually before. And someone will schedule a lunch or a breakfast with me, and they'll say, hey, let's do it at this time. And I get there, and I'm there a couple of minutes early, and I get in the booth, and they you know, pour coffee or whatever. And if they're five or ten minutes late, of course, they walk in and go, oh, I always say, no problem, no problem, yeah, no big deal. Inside, I'm going, big deal, big deal. <laughs> so if you're late when you have lunch with me, you'll know what I'm thinking. I think I get this not wanting to wait on other people from my dad. I really do. My dad's not a good waiter. I think I inherited it from him. On Sunday mornings, when I was a kid growing up, my dad was the pastor of the church, so this will be an interesting story. But on Sunday mornings, we'd all be getting ready, and my dad would be all dressed and ready, and he'd be in the car, and he'd be getting ready to go to church, and, you know, um, my, my, and he'd be waiting for my mom. And he couldn't understand why it always took her so long to get ready. She only had four or five kids to get ready and lunch on and all of that. And so he'd go out to the car, and he had this routine. He'd get in the car, and he'd start it. And their driveway was right under their bedroom window. And he'd wait there for about two minutes, and then you'd hear, and this would go on for about two minutes. If that didn't speed my mom along, he would honk the horn. And if that didn't do it, he would send one of us kids back in the house and said, he'd say, ask your mother what's taking so long. And my mother would come down completely calm and completely holy. Not. And they would have this less than holy conversation all the way to the church. And then they'd stand up there and go, God is good, is he not? And the only reason you're laughing is because it happened to you too. You do the same thing. And so waiting for little annoyances can be hard. Waiting on other people can be a little harder, but waiting on God can be really hard. Waiting on God can be really hard. God seems to make a promise, or God gives you sort of an indication or a direction. You know, you have the sense of hope that something is going to change, something's going to happen. God tells you the what's going to happen, but he doesn't tell you the when. And you think, okay, God's leading, God's guiding, this is when it's going to happen. And then it takes a long time. And there's a big gap between the now where God says it's going to happen and the then when it does happen. And you can get kind of frustrated and disappointed and even question God. Waiting on God and His timing is not all that easy for any of us. You see, sometimes we forget that God sees the big picture when we don't. God sees time so different than we do. God has a whole different perspective when it comes to time and when things happen. I remember hearing the story of a guy who was praying to God, and God answered him verbally, and God said, you can ask me anything you want, three questions. And the guy said, God, I just want to know, I just want to know, does a thousand years feel like a day to you, God? 
And God answers, yes, it does. And he says, God, does a thousand dollars feel like a penny to you, God? God says, yes, it does. Guy says, God, here's my question. Can I have a thousand dollars? God answered, in a second. Sometimes waiting on God isn't easy, but the most intense waiting on God is when it's something life-altering or life-impacting, and you're waiting on Him, and you're praying, and you're praying, and you're in the now, and you're waiting for the then, and it's a big then. It's not happening like you think or when it should, and the bigger it is, the harder it is to wait. I mean, some of you are single waiting for that right person. Some of you are married and you're waiting for God to give you the gift of a child. Some of you are out of work and you're waiting to find a job and you've kind of stretched your resources and used the, you know, sort of, you've cashed in most of your reserves. And you're wondering, now what? Some of you are waiting for a healing in your life. Maybe it's an emotional healing. Maybe it's a physical healing. Some of you are waiting for the emotional pain to go away because of what someone did to you or some wounds you experienced through some circumstance in your life. Some of you are waiting for your kids to find their way back home, your teens to grow up, your adult children to move out. Some of you are waiting for a spouse to find recovery from an addiction that is wrecking your relationship. Some of you are waiting for your marriage to get better. Some of us today are waiting on some pretty big things waiting for God to step in, because these are big life issues. And when we face big challenges like that, it just makes waiting harder. It just makes it harder. And the reality is you and I don't have a choice whether we have to wait or not. It just happens to us. We don't get a choice whether we have to wait or not. What we get to choose, we do get a choice, though. And it's choose how we will wait. How will we wait while we have to wait? We can either passively wait or we can patiently wait. Passively wait, waiting simply means I sit back, cross my arms, and wait for whatever to happen, happen. Patiently waiting is saying during that time in the zone of waiting, I'm going to make some choices to do some things while I'm waiting. And James, the younger brother of Jesus, as he's writing to people of his church, a large church in Jerusalem, who have been experiencing incredible injustice at the hands of people in the world simply for being fully devoted followers of Jesus. They've experienced significant life struggles with some pretty intense hardships. We know that because of some of the other things James has already written. And they're waiting for God to bring about justice. They're waiting for God to end their hardships. They're waiting for God to answer their prayers that they've been praying for a long time, and they feel this intense pressure of waiting. In fact, it got so bad that they want Jesus to return and put an end of human history, say, God, we've had enough. We don't even want to wait for you to return. Come on now. And James nets it out how we are to wait in those times. And these are the words... He says, be patient, then brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. He simply says, wait patiently. Wait patiently. That's what he says, until the Lord returns. He's not talking about the Lord returning and waiting patiently for that. What he is saying is, till Jesus returns, the promise that Jesus gave in John 16, will become a reality. In this world, you will have trouble. And until Jesus returns, that's our reality. It was their reality. In this world, you will have trouble. And when Jesus returns, that will be, there'll be a, an end to all that. But he says, while you're in the zone where you will have trouble, he says, you have to wait patiently. Wait patiently till the Lord returns. Now, I'm not good with patience. That's probably why I don't like to wait. Some people are way more patient than I am. Sue is way more patient than I am. That's how she puts up with me. Some of you may say, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of patience. Like, it's a gift that some people have and some people don't. It isn't. Patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. It says that we have this fruit, this, this, this outpouring, when the Spirit of God is working in our lives, the Spirit of God is changing us. It says that we have love, we have joy, we have peace, we have patience. Patience is a gift that the Spirit gives us, but it doesn't flow like fairy dust alone. 
Patience is not a feeling we have. It is not an emotion we experience. It is a choice we make, a spirit-filled and enabled choice. And James says that we have to patiently wait. We, waiting patiently is different than waiting passively. Waiting passively is simply sitting in the now and doing nothing or little while we wait, sitting with our arms crossed and waiting, saying, okay, God, uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting, God, come on. That's passive waiting. Patiently waiting is when we embrace a series of choices while we are waiting that makes the experience of waiting more positive. Now, this might sound like something that's heretical, but I'll explain it. I believe one of the factors that keeps most people passively waiting instead of patiently waiting is prayer. It's prayer. It is. Because all we do while we're in the zone is pray about it. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying while you're waiting. I'm going to talk about that in a few moments so that it's important. But if all we do is simply pray and sit back and kind of wait for the fairy dust to fall from heaven all by itself so that the now and the then get closer, that's passive waiting. It's like that silly story, many of you have heard it, where the guy is out boating and his boat capsizes and sinks to the bottom and he's treading water for over an hour. And he prays, God, God, please rescue me. And along comes a boat. The guy says, do you want me to help you in the boat? And he says, no, no, I'm waiting for God to rescue me. Along comes another boat. Can I help you? And he says, no, no, I'm waiting for God to rescue. I'm praying and praying that God will rescue. And then comes a helicopter and a rope comes down. So, you know, the Coast Guard or whatever. And they yell down, grab the rope. He says, no, 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 I'm waiting for God to rescue me. And the guy drowns. He gets to heaven, and he's really angry. God, why didn't you rescue? And God says, I sent the boats and the helicopter. And that may sound like a silly story, but many of us are doing exactly the same thing. I knew a couple who said that they wanted their marriage to improve because it was struggling, and they believed that they had a word from God that he was going to restore that marriage, that relationship, and they prayed about it. And a friend came along and said, here's a counselor I think you should see. And they said, no, no, we're just going to pray about it. And then someone said, you need to go to Alpha Marriage. And they said, no, we don't have the time, and and it it probably wouldn't be good for us. We're just going to pray about it. And um, someone said, well, here's, you know, some reading that you could do that might help this situation. They said, no, we're just going to pray about it. And that marriage ended because... They waited for God, but they waited passively instead of doing things that they should have done. Now, I'm not saying that God couldn't have miraculously restored that relationship. I'm not suggesting that one way or another. But what I am saying, it doesn't seem to be the way the Bible works. God can do the miraculous. He can. But there are some principles that James gives us that we need to think about while we patiently Wait. So, I'm going to give you five principles this morning. Right out of here, going verse to verse, then we'll be done. We'll be done by 11.15, so all you soccer fans can get home and watch the game. First way, first principle is called the cooperative effort principle. The cooperative effort principle. And it goes something like this. I will do all I am able to do, then God will do what I am unable to do. I will do all I'm able to do, then God will do what I'm unable to do. And James tells us this, is what he says. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring ranks. Now, in that culture, it was, very, it was a climate that was very, uh, very arid, very dry, And they had rains in late November and rains in early April. And it was really only water they got to water those crops. And so they would wait on God to send the rain, and then they would have a harvest. But the rain would be useless if the farmer didn't cultivate the ground, fertilize the ground, prepare the soil, plant the seeds, and remove the weeds. Could you imagine him saying, God, give me a great crop. God's going to put the seeds in the ground. 
And the farmer had his responsibility. He did everything he could do. He could not control the weather. The one thing he couldn't do is control the weather, and he trusted God for that. We wait between now and then, and there are things that we need to do while we patiently wait that we are able to do. Some people pray for wisdom. God, give me wisdom. But they never read their Bible, never listen to great teaching, never read great books, never see wise counsel. They passionately wait or they passively wait for wisdom. The Bible says that we are to seek wisdom over and over. Seek wisdom as if it's a treasure that we have to dig out of the ground. We have a responsibility when we pray, God, give me wisdom. God's going, okay, seek it. Seek it. Someone is looking for a job and they're praying about it. They hand out a few resumes and then they wait. Instead of knocking on doors and using contacts and social media like LinkedIn and so on, or asking around or getting help put a resume together that might be better. They do none of that. They just send a couple of resumes and go, okay, God, I'm waiting for the job. Some people who are lonely and they pray about friendship but refuse to find their ways to places where they'll find genuine community, maybe a small group. They go, I haven't got the time. Time and time again, we're waiting for something, but are we doing all that we are able to do to make it happen? Will we wait passively or patiently? Now, you know, there's the story of Lazarus. It's one of those famous Bible stories. And Lazarus dies, and that's, this is a great story. I'm not going to tell it all, but it's a great story about the timing of Jesus. Jesus, you know, says, I'm not going while he's sick and dying. And when he dies, he says, then we'll go. And Jesus shows up, and they're waiting for, you know, they're, they're, all, they're, they're mourning and grieving. And Jesus shows up, and he says, oh, no, the, the, this is going to change. This is going to happen differently. And he walks over to the tomb. You know what Jesus doesn't say? Lazarus, come forth. He doesn't say that first. What does he say? Remove the stone. He says to those people, this is your job. You remove the stone. And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. There's this cooperative effort that has to take place. Now, there's a little caution. There's a little caution that I want to give you here. In doing all we can do, we don't want to bypass God's way of handling it or dealing with it or disobey God's way to get the then we want now. There's a great story in the Bible. It's a story of uh, Abraham and Sarah, and God promises them they're going to have a child. They don't have any children. God promises it. And um, it's taking a long time. They wait more than 20 years, and they're getting really old. And they have this idea that they're going to both, you know, they're wearing depends, and the baby will be wearing diapers or getting that old. And they cook up this plan, and he's to have sex with her servant. And he goes along with it. And they have this child, this servant woman in Abraham, and it's a mess. God did not want it that way. But they wanted there then, now, and didn't want to wait on God, and they took matters into their own hands. And maybe you've been praying for something, and maybe you're trying to shortcut God's zone of waiting. You know, maybe you're praying to be financially stable and secure, and you're buying lottery tickets, bypassing God's way of financial stability of hard work, wise spending, dealing with debt, and wise savings. Or maybe you're lonely and decide to hook up with the first person that comes along simply because they're breathing. (laughs) And you know your values and worldviews are radically, radically different. And you know God doesn't want that to happen. But you're going, but I'm lonely, and I don't want to wait for God's then. I'm going to do it my way. And we have to be very cautious that when we are doing this, that we are doing it God's way and in obedience to God's Word. I mean, I came face-to-face with this cooperative effort principle uh, lately. You know, there, you know one of the struggles I face on a daily basis is the whole financial picture here at Lakeside. And we're a little behind budget, and cash flow is really tight, and all sorts of stress goes with that. I, I feel it. And I've been praying and praying about it, that God would inspire some of you who give little or nothing, just send, you know, fairy dust from heaven and inspire you all of a sudden. You write big, huge checks and everything will be fine. Lately, I've realized that's not good enough. That's not good enough. And so I have been reading everything I can about funding and going to a whole bunch of seminars and some of the wisest people bringing them around the table. We put a plan together. We're going to help you be better with your money because some of you want to give, but you can't. We want to talk about this and teach more because that's all I'm able to do. And I'm going to do everything I can do. And then I'm going to let God do his thing. So whatever you're waiting for, you need to pray about it, but you need to do everything you can. Now, there's a, another little principle that kind of goes side, alongside of this one, and it's called the power along the way principle. It kind of goes with this one. 
And this is about taking a step of faith. You know, God gives us a direction or God says, I'm going to sort this out or God says, I'm going to help you with a challenge or struggle and you really believe that. You have to take the first step of faith instead of passively waiting. And in the, the Old Testament, there's a story of the nation of Israel and they need to cross the Jordan River and it's at flood stage and they can't cross it and they're getting close to the promised land, the land, you know, the then that God promised. And they're kind of right in about here. And God says to Joshua, tell the people to consecrate themselves, to pray, to get themselves right with God and to pray. And then he says this, and have them walk in the water. And they start walking. The priests first carry the Ark of the Covenant, and they start walking in the water. and gets up to their ankles, up to their knees and whatever. And I'm sure they're wondering, how far are we going to walk? How far are we going to walk before we drown? And they keep walking, keep walking, those steps of faith, and then the water parts and they walk on dry ground. See, I think that God wants all of us, to, the power along the way principle, to be enacted while we're waiting, that we take these steps of faith. Think of the theme of money. I know there's some people who have said to me, Pastor Dave, I would love to give, but I can't give until I get my financial house in order. Maybe God is saying, give first and I'll help you get your financial help house in order. Power along the way principle. A principle of a cooperative effort between us and God. First one's the longest one for all of you Dutch fans. Next. The second is the proactive, persevering principle. James says these words, proactive perseverance. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, the little phrase, stand firm, I don't often use biblical languages, but biblical language here is Greek. And in Greek, these, this little phrase, stand firm, is three words. Styraxate tas cardias. Styraxate tas cardias. Styraxate, we get our English word, steroid, which means to what? Strengthen. Cardios, we get our English word what? Cardiac, which is heart. What is he saying? Strengthen your heart. That's what he's saying. While you're awaiting, we must say to ourselves, I must strengthen my heart. We need to, in the zone between now and then, we need to drop the anchor of our heart into the rock-solid character of God. We need to anchor to the person of God, the presence of God, the promises of God, believing that the Philippians promise that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength is true. We need to strengthen our hearts. We need to stand firm. We need to strengthen our hearts. There's this story over in the Old Testament, story of King David. I'll just read it self-explanatory. David and his men had reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev, which was a region, and Ziklag, which is a city. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them but carried them off and they went on their way. And when David and his men came to Ziklag, which was their hometown, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters had been captive. Now, I want you to think about that, men. You've arrived and Everybody who you love has been taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. That's how grieving they are. David's two wives had been captive, had been captured. Don't get into polygamy. Graham will explain that someday. Um, but it said this, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. That's a real leadership moment. Each one of them was bitter in spirit because their sons and daughters had been taken captive. And then it says these words, but David, but David found strength in the Lord. In the middle of the darkest time waiting for God to do something, David found strength in the Lord. David found strength in the Lord. In Isaiah, and, and James says, look at the prophets. And so let's look at one of my favorite prophets. Isaiah says these words, why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause. Oh, I have this cause, I have this thing I, that I want. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know, have you not heard? So they're kind of complaining, God, we're having to wait and we don't like it. Do you not know, have you not learnt, heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He has his ways. He is fully strong. He's talking about the character of God. And he says, God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. God will do that. Then he goes on. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Now, I think we read this last verse passively, as if we wait something happens to us. As I've been studying this and meditating on it and looking at what some others say, they go, no, it's actually sort of proactive. He's saying, 
those who hope or wait, it could be the same word, wait, waitful hope in the Lord, they will choose to renew their strength. They will choose to soar on wings like eagles. They will choose to run and not grow weary. They will choose to walk and not grow faint. That's what we do while we wait on the Lord. I think we think we get all that by fairy dust, by waiting. I don't think, I, when, as I've studied the grammar on this and read what some others said, they go, no, this is proactive. And that's what we need to choose to do. How do we do it? Well, there's lots of great Bible stories of people who waited. Read the story of Abraham alone. Wait, 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 God told him, and he did pretty much. Maybe we can be strengthened. Listen to the stories of others. There's other people around here who've had to wait, and God came through. Maybe it's just part of being part of a little small group or a group of com community people that will encourage you and strengthen you while you're waiting. Maybe it's just being aware of the promises of God and clinging to them and putting on the armor of God when the evil one tries to discourage you or maybe just go out and make a difference in the lives of others. will strengthen your heart. But we need to strengthen our heart. Next principle he gives us is the positive attitude principle. The positive attitude principle. That's what he says. Don't grumble against each other, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. In other words, God's watching. He said, don't grumble, grumble against each other. Now, where we get confused is understanding what this word against means. This is not talking about grumbling about someone. This is the word against could actually be the word upon. It's kind of grumbling upon someone. It just wouldn't make sense in the grammar. So when you grumble against, it means you go to somebody and you grumble to them. That's what it's kind of about here. And it's amazing that we all get the grumblies, don't we? When we're in that zone of waiting. I don't know about you, but I do. It's a negative emotional experience, and the longer I have to wait, the more the grumblies take hold. And the grumblies set in, and we grumble to others, and we grumble about others because we think they're standing in the way of me getting the then. It's choosing to have this positive attitude while waiting. It's choosing, I'm not going to grumble about this. I'm going to have a positive attitude. Now, again, it's, it, it, it may be starting the day with saying, hey, this morning, God, I want today to be a positive day. Things aren't happening like I want them to be, but I want it to be a positive day while I wait for you today. Make it positive. Choose to be positive. Now, I'm not talking about the pos power of positive thinking. You know that writing that says, if you have positive thinking, good things will come to you? I'm not talking about the secret, the law of attraction. It came out in a book a, a few years ago where if you just have the right positive thoughts, the things that you want, the then that you want will happen. I mean, there's preaching these days in some of the largest churches that are the whole idea that the positive thinking brings the blessing of God. That is not biblical. Because sometimes God wants you to wait, and there's a reason for it. All I'm suggesting is, is that we have this positive attitude, this positive thinking in the then, so that it changes us, so that we can wait better. It's amazing how negative we can get when we're waiting. I can get really negative. I, you know, I was thinking about a bunch of stuff this week, and I was writing my journal, and it was Tuesday, and I was back to work, and I was really grumbling. I had the grumblies, like, really bad. And I was grumbling to God and saying, God, what are you up to? Where's, when are you going to answer the prayer? When are you going to bless me, God, when I, like I think you should? When's the then going to happen, God? And it was like God looked down, and I felt this rebuke from God saying, I have so blessed you. I have so given you so many good things. And in my timing, trust me, because if you look back, my timing's been perfect. And I tell you, I closed my journal, and I felt way more positive. And I said, God, I'm going to wait to the best of my ability. The next principle is this one. It's what's called the productive or the productivity principle. And it goes this way. The product principle goes this way. God is often most productive during the times of waiting. Ever notice that? The longer you wait, how God does work in your life. James says this. James says these words. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You may have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. He's saying, look at Job's life and look what happened in the end as Job waited patiently. Job got to see firsthand the fullness and the greatness of God. God spoke to him. Three or four chapters, God speaks directly to Job, and he sees the greatness and the awesomeness and the power of God. 
Job got to watch his character be refined and developed by God. Job's trust changed in God. Job got to see what his friends were really like. And then Job got to see the then that was far greater than his imagination. God often uses the time of waiting to grow our trust in him and refine and develop our character. God does some of his best work in our lives in the zone of waiting. He really does. That's what God does in the zone of waiting. He refines our character. In the zone of waiting, God builds our trust. In the zone of character, in the zone of um, waiting, God shows us his presence. We learn more about God and we learn more about ourselves. I mean, James starts off the book with that thought in mind. Right? He says in James 1, 2, and 3, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know this is a testing of your faith and it develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He's saying, sometimes in waiting, we need to be mature and complete and learn to not lack anything. And too many people hit the eject button too early. And they give up on God or they bail on God altogether. And they miss out on so much of the great work that God wanted to do in their lives and the great then that he wanted to bless them with. Not easy to believe, you know, God's chiseling my character while I'm waiting in the zone of waiting. But he is. Character that is trust, learning to trust him better and deeper. Character that's being refined in me. Sometimes we wait in the challenges and the struggles, and God does his best work, doesn't he? You know, in the early part of this century, there was a pianist named Paderewski. And this is how the story goes, and I believe it's a true story. He was giving a concert in a great auditorium, but, and the people had gathered, and the auditorium was jam-packed, but he was delayed coming on stage for whatever reason. And he hadn't come to the piano yet, and the audience was waiting, and the time had, for the concert to begin had, had long passed. And the people are waiting, and while they're waiting, this little eight-year-old boy leaves his seat. His mother isn't keeping tabs on him. She probably dragged him to the concert and didn't want to be there anyway. But he gets up from his seat, and he runs down the aisle, and he runs up the stairs, and he gets to the stage, and he sits down on the bench, and he begins playing, dun 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 you know, chopsticks? He starts playing that. And there's like this buzz going through the auditorium. People are saying, get that kid off the stage. Well, Paderewski hears this. He hears this happening, and he puts his jacket on. He's in the wings, and he goes out on stage, and he doesn't call security. He just walks on stage, and he puts his big arms around the kid, and his two giant hands begin to improvise chopsticks so that it becomes this awesome duet, and what was a mess is a masterpiece. And the audience sees him leaning over, whispering something in the little boy's ear, probably like, when we're finished, kid, I'm going to knock your block off. Actually, that's not what he was saying. He just says to the little boy one thing. Don't stop playing. Don't quit. Just keep going. Together we can make this a masterpiece. And sometimes in the middle of our waiting, God brings his big arms around and starts playing beside us. And what seems like a mess turns out to be a masterpiece. One thing we need to understand that in our lives there is deeper music that God wants to play. And we often learn to play that very music as God teaches us the notes while we're waiting. Final one. little bank shot here at the end. Where am I going here? Okay. Deja vu. Just hang in there. I don't know how that got way back there. There we go. Oh, there it is. The prayer principle. The prayer principle. He says this. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous righteous man is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And he is not talking about praying so much that God will see it and do it our way. He's not so much talking about that God, we're praying, God, give me the then, give me the then. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to pray that way. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about with discipline and with diligence, we pray in order to discern the heart of God, to discern God's perspective on this. 
And sometimes we're praying for a then, and God says, wait, and we want to discern his perspective on that. And God's saying, wait, we want to discern that. Sometimes we're praying for something to happen, and God says, it's going to happen differently than you think. I've disguised the way it's going to be answered. And you go, okay, I get that. Thank you, God. And sometimes while we're praying and while we're waiting, God says no. And we need to discern that so we can stop waiting altogether. It is praying what I call the garden variety prayer. Garden variety prayer. It's the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden. Not my will, but God, your will be done. It's discerning the heart of God and then wait for it. I think the reason so many of us get frustrated and disappointed while waiting is that we haven't waited on God's answer for God's discernment. It's not easy. This does not come easy. I'm telling you. But we diligently pray and say, God, reveal what am I to wait God, reveal your will. Reveal how you want this to play out. It says the prayer that is righteous, that is effective, that is powerful, is a prayer of humble surrender to God. Saying, God, have it your way. Which is the toughest prayer to pray while you're waiting. It is. It is. In the zone of waiting between now and then, It can be a wilderness. It can seem dark. It can be disappointing and discouraging. It can be frustrating and fatiguing, and our tendency is wanting to quit, to hit the eject button and stop the movie from finishing. I felt that a little bit this week. I was frustrated, really frustrated about a whole bunch of stuff, and I thought, oh, Lord, I just want to throw in the towel. I really do. And while I was saying that, I'm feeling, you know, really sorry for myself. My Bible fell open to the back page, and on one side of my Bible in the back page, I don't know where the cam- which camera are we on? Right there. I got two cards. One of them is promises of God, and I read through those promises, and it encouraged me. It reminded me of the presence of God and that God is with me. It reminded me of all the things that He promised to provide for me, and it strengthened my heart. And then I read this, and I want to read this in closing. It just says these words. When things go wrong, and they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but all you can do is sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but do not quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, and every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup, and he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, a silver tint of the cloud of doubt, and you'll never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far, So stick to the fight when you're hardest hit, and when it seems the worst, please don't quit. Please don't quit. Don't quit. It's about waiting on God.
be taking every step in obedience while I'm step in obedience yeah I'm waiting I will serve you while I'm waiting I will worship while I'm waiting I will So this morning, maybe there's something you're waiting on. You're saying, God, this is what I've been waiting for. For some of you, you've been waiting a long time. And maybe today you just need to pray, God, what is your, what is your leading, your guiding, your will on this one? Help me to discern that. Maybe you've been waiting a long time and you know, it just seems hard to wait on God. Do not quit. Do not quit. See him put his big arms around you and the two of you playing a masterpiece together. Do not quit, but wait. And maybe you want to pray with someone. There'll be some people down here in front who will just pray with you. Maybe you just want to pray about that very thing that you're waiting on, that you're waiting on. And uh, I want to send you away with these words. It's kind of a benediction. It's from Psalm 37. King David writes, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently on Him. God bless. Have a great long weekend.